Now, like I said, for our scripture lesson today, we're going to go to Psalm 51. Now, Psalm 51 is a portion of the scripture that is familiar to us. You know, Psalm 51 is the a prayer of repentance that David offered up after he was convicted of his sin by the preaching of the prophet Nathan. And so we're going to you know, look at Psalm 51 as we work through our, our second part on total depravity. So let's go ahead and go to the word of God. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore, restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Amen. Now, you know, last week when we talked about total depravity, one of the things that we uh, you know, explained is how we became a sinner. You know, where sin comes from, and the penalty uh, that uh, we bear because of the sin that we have committed in Adam. And this week we're going to talk a little bit about how depravity affects us. You know, what is it about sin that changes who we are? Now, first of all, we are reminded in God's word that the primary thing that sin has done is break the image of God, right? The, the, the image that we have been made in is broken by our sin. And what we mean by that is, you know, when we go back, for instance, to the fourth question of the Shorter Catechism, uh, which is, who is God? In that catechism question, we are told some certain things about God. Now, in that question, it says, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable. And then we have a phrase, in his being, wisdom, power, justice, holiness. Does anybody else know the rest of it? Goodness and truth. Good job. Now, those second half of that, in his being, it's what we call, again, time for big words, the communicable attributes of God. What that means is, it's attributes that are communicated, given to us by the Lord God in the image that we are made in. So sin affects all of those attributes that we've been given. So, you know, some of those are easy to understand, like goodness, right? Because we have sinned in Adam, what are we no longer? Good, right? We have become evil. Now, you know, also, because of sin, no longer do we know the difference between good and evil, right? So justice has been perverted in sin. So if in our sinful state, and we're given a choice between doing that which is good and doing that which is evil, what are we going to choose every single time? Evil, right? Because that is the desire of our heart. That's what we want to do. Um, you know, in Kennedy's class, we were talking about this, and you know, the you know, reality is is that if our parents tell us to clean our room and we're playing a video game, you know, what do we continue to do? Play the video game. Play the video game. That's right. Yeah, that's what words of experience. Now, why do we continue to choose to play the video game? That's what we want to do, right? Because that is the inclination of our heart, right? To do that which we want to do. Now, 
that is a consequence of sin. Because, for instance, when the Lord tells us, thou shalt not covet, what are we not supposed to do? Covet. Covet, right? Now, Paul in Romans 7 says that the law taught him that he wasn't supposed to covet. But, hearing thou shalt not covet, what did Paul want to do? Covet, covet right? You know, the law moved him to sin, right? It's not the law's fault, right? Paul can't say, well, if you hadn't told me I wasn't supposed to covet, then I wouldn't have coveted, right? You know, we, we can't blame others for our desire to sin. But because we are sinners, we choose to sin. We love to sin. And that's the effect that depravity has on us. Now, you know, there's some aspects that that affects. You know, first of all, it affects our mind. Right? It affects how we think. So, for instance, in Psalm 14, we hear the psalmist say, you know, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. Right? So the fool, right? And, and, and what is a fool? Right? When we talk about fools, what do you usually mean? Right? People who make bad decisions, right? But it's not just people who make bad decisions. It's people who should know better. Right? People who have been taught good things, who have been taught the truth, and have the possession of the truth, what do they do with the truth? Throw it away. Throw it away. Exactly. Right? They rid themselves of it. So the psalmist here is saying, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Because what does the fool know about God? He exists, right? Now, when we think about that of our minds, right? You know, Paul in Romans 7 says that he knows what he's supposed to do. But what doesn't he do? What he's supposed to do, right? And that's because of sin, because of the presence of sin. Now, one of the things that's happened to us, one of the things that David prays for in Psalm 51 is that what does he want God to do for him? Right? Create in him a clean heart, right? Because we can't just have a little bit of sin taken away. Uh, because how much, how much leaven do you need to cause the, the, the lump to rise? It, it, you know, an atom, right? Well, probably not an atom. It probably needs like a molecule or something. Uh, I don't know exactly how all that science stuff works. But um, you, know, you need, it, it just takes a little bit, right? Because you think in the days of the Passover, you know, what was one of the things you were supposed to do? Right? Clean the house, right? Sweep the house out. Because what did you want to get out of the house? All the leaven, right? Because what kind of bread were you supposed to eat with the Passover? Unleavened bread, right? And that all that stuff was given to teach us about the nature of sin, right? So even the littlest presence of sin, what's it going to do to our mind? It's going to take us away from the Lord. And that, again, is the effect, that depravity that sin has upon us. But it doesn't just affect, you know, how we think. It also affects how we learn. Now... You know, when Jesus was a little boy, did he have to learn how to talk? No. Yes. yes. Right? You know, Jesus didn't come out of the womb proclaiming the gospel. Right? He had to learn the same way we do. Now, the difference between Jesus and us is what did Jesus not have present? Sin. Sin right? So, you know, I use this example with the kids, but, you know, when Joseph, who was a carpenter, was teaching his son Jesus how to cut wood how many times did Joseph have to tell Jesus how to do it once right because what's the difference between Jesus' brain and our brain we have, sin. <laughs> we have sin so when Jesus learned something he knew it right he didn't have to be retaught things right so you know, if you were Jesus' school teacher what were his grades <laughs> right straight A's across the board Right, because you know, he was able to retain information in ways that were not. Right? Have you ever wondered why you struggle with understanding things? Well, why do you struggle to understand stuff? Right? Because of sin, right? Because your minds are darkened by sin, right? Your, 
ability to understand is darkened by sin. Right? If we didn't have sin, you know, we'd all be good at math, right? We'd all be good at science. We'd all be good at English. But because of the presence of sin, we aren't able to do everything, right? We aren't able to understand everything. In fact, we're not even able to understand everything that God tells us, right? And because of the presence of sin, even after we're saved, even after we are renewed in the Spirit of God, what do we have to constantly be reminded of? Right? We have to constantly be reminded about the gospel. Right? We need to be refreshed with the knowledge of Christ because you know, if we leave it alone, what's going to happen? We're going to forget it, right? It's just like anything else, right? You know, you know, there was one point in time where I really knew how to um, you know, do you know, you know, um, soccer skills, right? Um, but what haven't I done in 20 some odd years? I played soccer. Now, could I just jump out and go play, you know, with my college team right now? No. No, right? Yeah, you know, it's not just because I'm older, right, and I'm out of shape and all that kind of stuff, right? But I'm out of practice, right? Because I haven't done it in a long time, right? I might remember, but I'd have to like re-teach my body how to go about doing certain things. And it's the same thing when we think about the gospel, right? That's why it's important for us to regularly be in the word, to regularly be in the presence of the preaching of the word and the teaching of the word. Because of the nature of sin, right? We're forgetful people. And what happened to Israel when they started perverting the worship of God? Right? They started forgetting what God had done for them. Right? They started forgetting what the Lord had provided for them, and so they ran off after the idols. That's why, for instance, when Josiah found the law of God in, or he didn't find it, but you know, the law of God was found in the days of Josiah, what happened when Josiah started hearing the word of God read? He started crying, right? Because what did he realize? How far from God he was and how far from God Israel was because they had forgotten what God had told them to do. And so he, you know, wears sackcloth and ashes. And in the Old Testament, why did people wear sackcloth and ashes? Right, right. It was a testimony to their sin, right? It was to show the way, you know, to show the world, to show others that they were in repentance, right? That they had... Um, you know, you know, caused themselves to be polluted. Right now, how did they get all that sackcloth and ashes off of? Them? Well, I mean, they got rid of it, but how did they get rid of it? Right by washing. Right, you know, this, that's exactly what John the Baptist is doing when he's going around preaching, preparing everybody for Jesus. Right, he's giving them ritual washings. Because it was a sign that they were preparing, right, for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So not only does the sin, it sin affect our minds, right, it affects how we learn, but it also affects our bodies. And we'll, we'll end on this, but, you know, how does sin affect our body? You know, ultimately, what does sin cause us to do? Bad right, die, right? Eventually, our body is going to quit working. Right, they, they, you know, it, it's it's reality. Right now, you know, the world doesn't believe that. Right, because what is the world always trying to do? Right, try to win a victory over death. Right, the, the world is all you know. If you turn on the TV for five minutes, what are you going to see on those commercials? Well, that too. But <laughs> how to live twenty more years? Right. You know, call this number and take this drug and you're going to be, you're going to feel better, right? Take this drug and you'll be able to look like you did when you were 20, right? You, you take this drug or follow this, you know, dietary plan and everything's going to go back to normal. Well, what's the reality of the situation? That doesn't happen. Right, it doesn't work that way, right? Because part of the reason is, is because... Right, most of those folks are charlatans, right, and they're looking to steal your money. But the reality is, it doesn't matter what how much you put into yourself, 
Can any of us win the victory over death? No. No. Now, how is the victory over death won? Right? Believing the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? It's a spiritual victory. Now, you know, when we talk about the victory over death, do we actually, you know, do, do we believe that we don't die? No. Right? That's not the victory we talk about, right? The victory we mean over death is the effect that death has upon us. Because for the Christian, when we die, what we believe about that death? Right? The sting of death is taken away, right? So when we die, we die in the Lord, and we have the promise that the, uh, the, the fellow on the cross had. Right? When Jesus looks at him, what does he say to him? Today you're going to be with me in paradise. Does Jesus say, you're going to get off the cross? No. He says, today you're going to be with me in paradise, which means that even though he's going to die physically, you know, what happens to his spirit? And he goes right into the presence of God. And so, you know, depravity, sin, right, it affects not only the way we think, right, it affects how we learn, and it affects our bodies. And the answer to all of this is what Christ has done for us at the cross. And, you know, sometimes that can be a little trite, a little easy of an answer, but guess what? It is an easy answer because it's the simplicity of what we have learned in the gospel. That the answer to sin is not more sin, right? It's not worldly treasures. It's not uh, the works of the flesh, but it's the finished work that Christ has given to us in his life and in his death on the cross and that we see exhibited for us in the empty tomb. And we'll go ahead and close on that. But any questions or, or comments or anything? All right. Well, let's go ahead and... Uh, you know, close our time in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for this time that you provided for us. We ask, dear God, that as you continue to teach us about the nature of our faith and the ways of your uh, you know, covenantal uh, a gift, dear God, that you would help us to see our need to rely on you, our need to remember uh, the weakness of our own flesh, uh, that we might, again, find our strength not in ourselves, uh, but in you who has given to us all things uh, because of your love for us. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and hear the benediction today uh, from Jude uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless for the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.